Hi everybody. Welcome back. So today we're going to go over chapter 3, which is on matter and energy. There's a little bit of a break from the math. There's still a little bit of math, but it's not as intense as chapter 2. So we're going to talk about physical states of matter, how to um, classify matter, and a few other topics, energy. Um, so it should be a fun ride. Let's go. So the first thing we're going to do is classify matter. We talked about matter in Chapter 1, and we said that it, it makes up everything, right? Anything that has mass and occupies space. But now we're going to get a little bit more technical and talk about some of the other ways that we can classify matter. Matter is classified according to its composition. We have two big classes of matter. The first is pure substances, and they have a fixed or definite composition. And we're going to talk more about these um, in just a second. The second is mixtures. So mixtures have two or more different substances. They're physically mixed, physically mixed, but not chemically combined. So you can use physical means to separate mixtures. Let's dive into pure substances more. So a pure substance is a type of matter with a fixed or definite composition. And to break down pure substances even more, so if you have pure substances, we can break down that subclass into two other classes. We have elements. And we have compounds. So an aluminum can consists of many atoms of aluminum. Aluminum is an element. Elements are pure substances that only have one type of material. Okay. So examples would be copper, lead, aluminum. Elements you find on the periodic table. Anything that's made up of just that one material is an element. Can't break it down any further. Once you just have copper, you can't break it down into anything else. Then there's compounds. So we have elements and we have compounds that fall under pure substances. A compound contains two or more elements in a definite ratio. So that means that you have a certain amount of each atom in a compound, and that never changes. So some examples would be hydrogen peroxide. If you've gotten a cut or a scrape or something like that, some, sometimes people use alcohol, but sometimes people use hydrogen peroxide, which is a little bit gentler. This is the chemical formula for hydrogen peroxide. H2O2. The ratio of hydrogen peroxide never changes. Table salt, something that's very common. NaCl, always, always in that ratio. Table sugar, always in that configuration. And of course, water is a great example. H2O, we all know that one. So compounds have two or more elements and they have a definite ratio. When you break down a compound, you're going to have elements. And you can't go any further than that. So if you were to chemically break down sodium chloride, which is table salt, you would get sodium metal and chlorine gas. Can't do anything more than that. So we just went through this part 
of our matter tree, okay? We talked about pure substances and how you can break those down into elements and compounds. Now we're going to talk about mixtures and how you can break down the category of mixtures even further. Remember that a mixture is a type of matter that has two or more substances that are physically mixed but not chemically combined, okay? And you can have different proportions of those substances. The other key thing that will help you determine whether something is a pure substance or a mixture is that you can separate a mixture by physical methods. So if you have a solid in water, and we're not talking about, well, you, you could have, you know, like salt, you know, dissolved in water. But if we're thinking about something that is not soluble in water, because that's the best visual image, like what's trying to be shown here, you can use filter paper or something like that, and you can separate the liquid from the solid. So you can physically separate a mixture, whereas a pure substance, you cannot do that. You have to use chemical means. We can break down mixtures even more to homogeneous and heterogeneous. So a homogeneous mixture, it's uniform throughout. You can't tell that there's different parts. So brass is a homogeneous mixture of copper and zinc atoms. So if you see a brass mixture somewhere, you can't say, oh, there's the copper part, there's the zinc part. Another good example would be salt water. You can't see the salt in there. It looks like regular water, but if you go to take a sip, you know what's there. But you can heat the water, which is a physical means of separation, and just be left with the salt. So that's a homogeneous mixture. Just to give you a little bit of a connection to homogeneous mixtures, another example of that would be air. Air has several different gases all mixed together, so we know that oxygen is in there because that's what we need to survive. But there's nitrogen and hydrogen and all these other gases also mixed in. If you've ever gone scuba diving, which hit me, no. But if you ever have or you're interested in it, you're going to need to have some kind of air to breathe. You need some oxygen gas because underwater, you can't breathe. You're not a fish. So there are three different examples of gases that you could potentially use for scuba diving. Okay? So nitrox has oxygen and nitrogen gas, heliox, oxygen and helium, and then trimix has oxygen, helium, and nitrogen. Those are all homogeneous mixtures. Cannot look at it and say, oh, there's that oxygen. I see that oxygen in that corner. Can't do that. So heterogeneous mixtures, that means that you can see the two, the different parts in the mixture, okay? So there's some variation in the different parts. But the key is that the different parts are visibly different. So if you put a piece of copper, like a penny, into a cup of water, that's a heterogeneous mixture. And you can clearly see the penny, clearly see the water. So that completes the classification of matter. Just to go through the relationships again, matter is the big subcategory. That's all the things, okay? Everything that has mass and occupies some kind of space, all the things. You can break that down into two smaller categories of pure substances and mixtures. When we're talking about pure substances, we can break that down to elements, which is as far down as you can go. And a step up from that is compounds, where you're combining two or more elements and they're always in that same ratio, 
You cannot physically separate it. You can't take water and physically separate the hydrogen from the oxygen. You have to use chemical means. Then we have mixtures. Homogeneous mixtures, you can physically separate them. So you can heat it and maybe take advantage of different melting points in the case of brass where there's copper and zinc metal. But you can't see that there's copper and zinc. It all just looks like one uniform thing. With heterogeneous, we're talking about putting a penny in water. You can clearly see there's two different things here, but it's still a mixture, and you can separate physically very, very easily, right? So let's do a quick learning check to identify each of the following as a pure substance or a mixture. This is a good place to pause. Do it real quick in your notebook or just close your eyes and think about it. And then you can uh, unpause the video and check your answers. So for A, pasta and tomato sauce, we can clearly see and just know you've had pasta and tomato sauce ever in your life, that those two things are very visibly different. There's, you can physically separate them. Toddlers are quite good at it. I know this for sure. So that's a mixture. Aluminum foil, well, it's just aluminum just a bunch of aluminum atoms. That means it's a pure substance. You can't physically separate anything out about aluminum foil. You could tear it apart, but that's not physically separating it into any component. Helium, that's an element. You can find it on the periodic table. So it must be a pure substance. And lastly, air. We said air is made up of a bunch of different gases. And while you can't see them all, you can physically separate them. So that's going to be another mixture. We'll do more of these types of questions in class. And we'll also break it down into the smaller subcategories of element, compound, um, things of that nature. So here's a check for heterogeneous versus homogeneous mixtures. So again, hit that pause button, close your eyes, think of your answers, maybe write them down, and then check your work. So a hot fudge sundae, homogeneous or heterogeneous mixture? It better not be homogeneous. I better see all the things, because I want to see that hot fudge on there. A homogeneous hot fudge sundae is called a milkshake, <laughs> okay? Shampoo. Now, your shampoo should not be lumpy. If it is, you've had it for a long time. So that is a bunch of different chemicals all mixed together. So that's going to be homogeneous. You can't see any of the separate components in there. You can't put some in your hand and say, oh, yeah, there's that sodium moral sulfate can't do that. Sugar water, same deal. Homogeneous. When I think of sugar water, I think of Kool-Aid, okay? Yeah, it's red. You can see it's red, but you can't just dip your hand and pull out some red. You can still physically separate the sugar from the water, but you can't visibly see that there's different parts. It all looks the same. Unless somebody ain't mixed it right. Because you can't just let anybody make the Kool-Aid. And then peach pie. Somebody, When someone wrote these, they must have been hungry. Because we have a hot fudge sundae. We got sugar water, which in my mind is Kool-Aid. And then peach pie, which it should have been cobbler, let's be real. But peach pie, there's the crust, there's the peaches, there's the kind of sugary sauce that it's in. So that's heterogeneous. Now I'm hungry. I'm like, hmm, maybe I need to make me a peach cobbler. Inspiration. 
for my family's meals today. All right, I'm sorry, y'all. I'm a little bit crazy. You should know this by now. So we finished up classifications of matter. Now we're going to talk about the states and properties of matter. So this, again, is probably stuff that you've encountered already um, in, like, high school and even grade school, quite honestly. But we're going to identify the states and physical and chemical properties of matter. So some of it will be reviewed, some of it won't be. So right now, we're going over the physical states of matter. So solids, that's a physical state of matter. They have a definite shape and a definite volume. You can't really crush them, okay? So if you think about your laptop, that's a definite shape, definite volume. The particles are really close together in a fixed arrangement. So really close together, and they don't really move very quickly. So this is an example here that I just drew. Tightly packed particles, okay? A real life example is amethyst, which I think is what, maybe February? Um, the, the birthstone for February? Correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not Google. But it's purple, it's very pretty. And the, the atoms that make up amethyst are packed in really tightly. So the gray and the red make up two different, they're two different atoms, okay? They're packed in really tightly and they don't really move. So that's a solid. It has definite shape and volume. Particles are packed tightly and those particles don't really, they're not trying to go nowhere. They're happy. A liquid has an indefinite shape but a definite volume. So if you think about water, you can take water from a pitcher and pour it into a glass. The water is going to take on the shape of whatever it's in. But let's say that I have a big beaker that I fill to the 50 milliliter mark. I can put it into a smaller beaker it's still going to be 50 milliliters. So that means that it has a definite volume. But the shape of the water is going to be different. It's going to look a little different in the smaller beaker than the bigger beaker. The particles in water are close together, but they're still moving around a little bit. But they move slowly. Finally, we're at gases. Gases are loosey-goosey. They have an indefinite shape and an indefinite volume. So whatever volume and shape their container has, that's what it's going to be. So you can, take, you can take a cube, which I'm not going to draw a cube. Just imagine that's a cube, and fill it with gas. Then you can take that same gas and compress it down and put it into a smaller cube. Same amount of gas, but it's going to take on the shape and volume of whatever container it's in. And these particles are far apart, and they're zipping around all fast. It's kind of like a, we had a backyard full of toddlers that just had birthday cake and ice cream. They're zipping all around. They're running everywhere. They're bumping into each other, right? That's what gases are. So this table compares all three states of matter, solids, liquids, and gases. So what you can do is take this part of the table and then this part of the table and try to fill in yourself the different characteristics for each of the three states of matter. And that's a good way to quiz yourself on whether or not you know the shape, the volume, arrangement, of particles, and all that stuff. And there's examples in this table. So make sure that you have a good example of each one. Again, this should be kind of a review. We've all known about solids, liquids, and gases for a long time. But you may not know about the different interactions between the particles and the movement of the particles. So we didn't mention the 
the interaction specifically, but they are on this table. So with the solids, they have a very fixed and close arrangement. So the interaction between the particles is strong. They don't want to go anywhere. It's very strong. With the liquid, it's pretty similar. The association with the particles between, so think about water, it's a pretty close arrangement. And they move, but they don't move a lot. So there's still a strong interaction between water particles. The gases, they're everywhere. It's far apart. There's pretty much no interaction between the particles. So the closer the particles are, the stronger the interaction between the particles. So if you can get that down, everything else should be smooth. So let's go through and identify each of these as describing a solid, liquid, or gas. Hit that pause button, go through it, make sure that you get it. You can double check your answers just by looking at the previous slide, or you can wait for me to write it. So just make sure you pause and do it. That's how you learn. So A, it has definite volume, but takes the shape of the container. That immediately makes me think of something like water, which is a liquid. And this is where having an example in your head helps you, because sometimes the wording of the question or the wording of the characteristic may throw you off a little bit. So if you can think about your example of a solid, example of a liquid, example of a gas, and say, okay, if I had ice, would that have a definite volume and take the shape of the container? No. Ice is ice. It's going to be formed as a little block. However it was formed, that's how it is. Liquid. Okay, if I have water, that has a definite volume and it takes the shape of the container. Okay. Gas. If there's steam, if I'm boiling some pasta or something, the gas and whatever that's coming off, does that have a definite volume? No, not really. It just kind of keeps expanding into the room. So that helps you to kind of process through these. For B, its particles are moving rapidly. The only thing that's moving rapidly in these, in these parts is gas. Everything else is slow or barely at all. Its particles fill the entire volume of a container. That's gas again, because it's going to expand or compress to fit whatever volume. Remember, it's loosey-goosey. It has no morals. Its particles have a fixed arrangement. Fixed arrangement is going to mean that they're close together, hanging out, not really wanting to go anywhere. That's a solid. Particles are close together, but moving randomly. That's a liquid. So make sure you got those, and if not, do like I suggested, fill in the chart and just kind of think about examples and kind of work it through in your mind. Okay. Now we're going to quickly do identifying the state of matter for each of the following. This question should be easy. If it's not, let me know. So make sure you pause it, do it real quick. Vitamin tablets. Those are solid. Eye drops, they better be liquid. You don't want no solid eye drops. That sounds painful. And then air in a tire, that's a gas. Now we're going to move on to talking about physical properties, chemical properties, physical changes, chemical changes. And these terms may be new to you. So if you haven't taken chemistry in high school, or it's been a while, or chemistry was, mm, then you're definitely going to want to pay more attention to this part, because this, is, this may not be review. But you're going to need to be able to tell the difference between all of these different terms. And they're kind of closely related, so it's easy to get them mixed up. So that's just a heads up. Physical properties. 
their characteristics that can be observed or measured without changing the identity of a substance. So you can look at something and tell its shape or its physical state, you know. Oh, that's a liquid. Oh, that's a solid. You can tell what shape it is. You can determine boiling or freezing points just by heating something or cooling it. That doesn't change the identity of the substance. It just changes the physical state. Density, the color, so things that you can observe by eye or things that you can just kind of heat it, you know, poke it a little bit, but not change anything about it. That's a physical property. So some examples of physical properties, if we look at copper, you can look at the color of copper. So there's like a reddish orange color. And you can see there's a cookware that uses copper because it's a great conductor. Um, it conducts heat and electricity really well. So you can literally cook with copper pans. And the wire that is wiring your house for electricity, copper, it's shiny. You can see that as well. It's solid, right? No pan. It's not a liquid pan. It's not a gaseous pan. It's solid. You can heat it up and figure out a melting point. Heat. Or, well, you can, yeah, you can heat it up and figure out a melting point. You can keep heating up and find a boiling point. I don't think that we have the means just in your, in your kitchen to get to those temperatures, so don't worry. But those are all physical properties of copper. Now we're going to talk about a physical change. So a physical property is something you can observe just looking at it or poke it a little bit, right? A physical change, we're talking about something happening. So we're talking about a change in state. So let's say you're going from a gas to a liquid. That's a change. A change in the physical shape. No change to the identity or the composition of the substance. We're just talking about something about it, the physical appearance changing, okay? So you can change your clothes, but you're still the same person. But a physical change, think about an action, okay? Whereas a property is just a description, something about the physical characteristic of whatever substance. So let's identify each of these as a change of state or a change of shape, okay? And these are, again, we're talking about physical change here. Change of state or change of shape. Both of those are physical changes. So pause it, try it, and then look for the answers. So A, chopping a log into kindling wood. Now, I am no lumberjack, okay? I am not the brawny man. So you will not catch me chopping no logs. But I do know that if you have a long log and you're chopping it into smaller pieces, that's a change of shape. The wood is still wood. You're not doing anything to change its state. You're just changing the shape of it, making it smaller. B, water boiling in a pot. Water is a liquid, right? And when you boil it, you're making a gas. So that's a change of state. You're going from one state of matter to another. Ice cream melting. Ice cream is kind of solid-ish, right? When it starts to melt, it's a sticky liquid. Again, that's a change of state. You could argue that it's a change of shape too, right? If you had a nice little uh, scoop of ice cream and then it starts to melt, it's no longer a scoop. But the predominant thing here is that it's a solid that is changing to a liquid because it's melting. But notice how for each physical change, there's some kind of a verb. Chopping, 
boiling, melting. Whereas the physical properties we're looking at, it's red, it's shiny. Those are adjectives. Now we're going to move on to chemical properties and chemical changes. So the chemical property describes what something might could do, okay? And yes, I said might could do, and I still have a PhD. It's all right. So it describes the ability of the substance to change into something else. So we're talking about the potential, what types of chemical reactions can this substance do. The chemical change is the actual reaction. Reaction, I abbreviate RxM. So when something is actually turning from one thing to another and it takes on new chemical and physical properties. So just like the physical properties and physical changes, the chemical properties is just a description of what it can do. It's the resume of the substance. I can do all of these things. I'm proficient in Microsoft Office, right? I've had X number of years of experience in this, whereas the change is what are you doing right now? Currently, you're enrolled as a student at A&T. Maybe you have a job, you know, it's what you're currently doing. So the chemical change is the actual reaction that's going on. During a chemical change, you're forming a new substance that's got a new composition, new chemical properties, and new physical properties. An example of chemical change is caramelization. So if you've ever had flan, then your life has been changed, okay? It's delicious. And the hallmark is that it's topped with caramelized sugar. So this part up here, there's this like a sauce, but it's caramelized. So that kind of this brown layer here, that's caramelized sugar. So you take sugar and you heat it up. There's chemical reactions that happen that modify that sugar to change it into something else. Cooking and baking, great examples of chemical changes happening to your food to make the, the molecules that make up the food taste different. Here's some examples of chemical and physical changes. So we're going to focus more on the chemical changes because we haven't gone through a lot of examples of that. So we talked about caramelization. But another example that you may be familiar with is rust. So in North Carolina, you're probably not going to experience rust. But if you are from a northern state or you've been to a northern state in the wintertime or you've seen somebody's car that's from a northern state where they get snow, you're going to see some rust because some people still drive in some beaters, bless their heart, okay? That cold, cold, cold air a lot of salt on the ground from, you know, melting the ice and the snow is going to rust the body of your car. That's a chemical change, going from nice, new, shiny to you're still driving that Ford Escort from 1999 and it's starting to rust out, okay? That's a chemical reaction, and that's a chemical change. This table gives examples of chemical and physical properties and changes. So you can compare the physical property to a physical change and a chemical property to a chemical change, okay? This just has the kind of basic definitions and some examples. So if you're still kind of iffy about it when you're doing your homework, then you can come back to these two tables and kind of compare and contrast. Okay, does this sound more like this? Or like this. So that's how you can use these charts. Let's go through and classify each property as a physical property or a chemical property. So pause it, try it out, and like I said, if you need to figure out, okay, I'm not really sure which one this is while you're doing your homework, 
compare it to things that you know. So if you have in your mind an example of a chemical change, an example of a chemical property, and so on, then you can do that comparison, and it will help you on the exam. Ice melts in the sun. We don't see anything about a chemical change happening. There's nothing about chemistry. Melting is a change of state. So that is a physical property. Paper can burn. Can, we're talking about potential here, right? So it's a description. And burn, that's a chemical reaction. So that's a chemical property. A silver knife can tarnish. Again, tarnish, that's another word for a chemical reaction that can happen with silver. So it's chemical. A magnet removes iron particles from a mixture. That doesn't sound like any chemistry going on. You're just kind of physically separating something. It just sounds like a, a physical property. So make sure you can do this type of thing and identify physical property versus chemical property. They can get a little tricky. Now we're going to identify physical change versus chemical change. Pause it, give it a try, and then look for the answers. Burning a candle. Anytime you see something with burning something, fire, that's chemical. Ice melting on the streets, that's a physical change. Toasting a marshmallow, that's kind of like caramelizing the sugar for flan. That's chemical. Cutting a pizza, we're just changing the shape of the pizza and just cutting it in slices because if you see somebody pick up a whole dog on pizza and fold it and eat, you should just leave because you don't know what that person is capable of. They've reached a level of I don't care that you just don't want to be around, okay? So that's a physical change. Iron rusting in an old car. We already talked about that. That is a chemical change that you may not see down here in North Carolina because people can keep their cars from 1995 and it's still not rusted out. But I lived in Michigan before living here. And you see some rusted out sadness, okay? So be be grateful your car will not suffer that fate. So we did a couple of sections on matter, classifying matter, talking about the states of matter, physical and chemical properties and changes, and the differences between all of those. Now we're going to shift gears to talk more about energy, okay? So temperature is related to energy because we're still talking about heat and kinetic energy in a system. The best example is using a thermometer to measure your body temperature. Everybody's been to the doctor's office. If you're in the nursing program or you wanna be in the nursing program, if you're a nurse, you're gonna be taking a lot of temperatures, okay? So the temperature of something is just how hot or cold something is in comparison to something else. And you have to use an instrument to measure it. So it's a measurement. You use a thermometer. On the right, we have a thermometer, and we've got different temperatures. So usually you hear, oh, yeah, 98.6. That's what you're supposed to be, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. It's actually a range, okay? If you're a lady your temperature will actually fluctuate depending on where you are in your menstrual cycle. If you're pregnant, it is common for your temperature to be slightly elevated. So instead of being 98.6, you might be more like 99 or 99.5. So temperature, there's a normal range, not just a normal temperature. You surely have been sick before and had a fever with the flu or something like that. 
Hyperthermia means you are too, too hot. And if your temperature is too high, you can die. The proteins and things in your body are meant to operate in a particular range. And if you bring them too far outside of that range, whether it's too hot or too cold, then you're doing some major damage. So there's different temperature scales. There's Fahrenheit, which is what we use typically in the U.S. So if you're watching the weather or looking it up on your phone, you're going to see Fahrenheit. Celsius is like everywhere else in the world. And the difference between these two is just how many degrees there are separating boiling and freezing of water, okay? On the Celsius scale, there's 100 degrees between boiling and freezing. So at zero degrees Celsius, you're going to freeze. 100 degrees Celsius, it's going to boil. We're talking about water. For Fahrenheit, it's 180 degrees. 32 degrees F, you're going to freeze. 212 degrees, you're going to boil. So that's the difference between those two temperature scales. Then there's the Kelvin temperature scale. There are no degrees. It is an absolute scale. So zero means zero. There's no degree symbol. It's just simply writing the letter K. Okay. There's no such thing as negative temperatures. Zero Kelvin is literally zero. Okay, so there's no heat in the system. And the unit size is the same as Celsius. So if I have a delta T, which remember delta is change, equal to five degrees Celsius, it's the same thing as saying I have a delta T of five Kelvin. Okay, so the unit size is the same. Here's a comparison of all three temperature scales looking at freezing and boiling of water. You're definitely going to want to know these different um, temperatures, okay? So there's freezing point, there's normal body temperature, and there's boiling point of water. So definitely know those. You can convert between degrees Celsius and degrees Fahrenheit. You just have to take into account the difference in the number of degrees between freezing and boiling of water. So there's a ratio for every 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit, you're going to increase by one degree Celsius. Okay. Taking that into account, you can do some math to come up with an equation to convert your temperature in Fahrenheit to your temperature in Celsius. You don't have to know all of the math that goes into it. If you're interested in it, you can look at it. But what you really want to know is this equation down here. And you'll be provided with the equation for the exam. So for converting temperatures, if you're trying to figure out Fahrenheit, that's up here, so degrees C to degrees F. The second one is degrees F to degrees C. Third one, we are taking our Celsius and turning it into Kelvin. And finally, we're taking Kelvin and making it degrees Celsius. So those are the four different equations for converting temperatures. Notice that you cannot convert directly from Fahrenheit to Kelvin.
you have to go through Celsius. So Fahrenheit to Celsius, and then Celsius to Kelvin. So let's practice that. Convert normal body temperature, which we'll just use 98.6 so everybody is on the same page, to Kelvin. Pause it, do it, and then take it from there. So the first thing we're going to do is we have to take our degrees Fahrenheit and convert it to degrees Celsius. Now you're going to have to choose the equations that you're going to use, but I put them here just because I'm nice like that. So our temperature in Fahrenheit is 98.6. You're going to subtract 32. Whatever that is, you're going to divide that by 1.8. You're going to get 37 degrees Celsius. Then, you're going to take that 37 and add 273. and you get 310 Kelvin. So that's normal body temperature in Kelvin. That simple. Moving on to energy. We're going to talk about the types of energy and why we care about it. So energy makes things move, gives you the ability to do work. We care about that. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. If you've taken any physics, you know, you know about kinetic energy. Some examples are swimming, water flowing, working out, all that stuff is kinetic energy. Potential energy is stored energy for later use. So it's something that you have based on the position of an object or the chemical composition of a substance meaning the bonds between atoms in substances, those contain energy. And you can break those bonds and release energy to do things. So examples of potential energy would be water at the top of a dam. It's just waiting to fall. Or like the ball on top of a hill, right? A compressed spring. It's just waiting to unload, right? And then there's chemical bonds and gasoline or coal, food. We eat food and then we break it down and that gives us energy, right? So those are all examples of potential energy. Now we're going to quickly identify whether each of these is an example of kinetic or potential energy. Pause it, give it a shot, and then check your answers. Rollerblading. That's moving. It's going to be kinetic. Peanut butter and jelly sandwich. My kids love those. That's potential. It's food. It's not doing anything yet, but your body breaks it down, and then you've got the energy to run and jump off of the couch and tuck and roll and all the things. Mowing the lawn. That's moving, so it's kinetic. Gas in the gas tank. Praise them if you got it. That's potential. So make sure that you can do those. Now we're going to talk about heat and energy. So heat is the energy associated with moving particles. The faster the particles are moving, the greater the heat or the thermal energy of the substance. So if you have an ice cube, as you heat it, the water molecules are starting to move more and more until eventually you no longer have an ice cube but liquid water. And remember, earlier we said solids, the particles don't move much. Or they're basically fixed. 
in a liquid, particles move slowly. That means that you're going from lower energy to higher energy because you've got more motion of the particles. There's different units of energy. The SI unit is the joule. We use calories, so you'll see that on nutrition facts. There's the lowercase c calories, and then there's kilocalories, which is the capital C that you would see on the back of whatever food you have that has nutrition facts. The calorie is defined as the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So however much energy you need to put into that water so that it increases by one degree, that is a calorie. We have an equality here. And we have some conversion factors. So one calorie is equal to exactly 4.184 joules. You'll be provided with that, but you will need to know how to take that equality and write conversion factors to go between calories and joules, joules and calories. This is an energy comparison chart. It shows you kind of amounts of energy and how they rank. So going all the way from the energy that we need to sleep, which remember, there's still a lot going on in your body, so you still need energy, all the way up to the energy radiated by the sun, everything in between, okay? Let's do a quick learning check. We're going to try using that equality to convert joules to calories. So pause it, give it a shot. Now let's get to it. How many calories are obtained from a pad of butter if it provides 150 joules of energy when metabolized? So a pad of butter, you may not know what that means, just a little bit. You got that just a little slice of butter to put on your biscuit, okay? So that little bit of butter provides 150 joules of energy. We need to convert that to calories. First thing we're going to do is write our conversion factors. So again, I'll label this as an equality so that we remember the terminology. And to write the conversion factors, which I abbreviate CS, you're going to take that equality and write it as a fraction. And since we're trying to get rid of joules, we're going to want joules in the bottom of our conversion factor. Always double check. And make sure you're not crazy. The joules cancel. You're left with calories. When you do the math, your calculator is going to tell you 35.85, and that's your calculator answer. Remember, that doesn't have any type of units or anything, but this is multiple choice. We got 35.85. The closest thing to that is 36 calories. So the answer is C. Now we're going to talk a little bit about energy and nutrition. We're going to calculate the energy values for foods. 
first we have to talk a little bit about how those nutritional facts come to be. How do they figure out the number of calories in a honey bun or a bag of Flaming Hot Cheetos or some Takis, right? What's used is called a calorimeter, and that's what's imaged here on the right. So it's this big cell that's got all this water in it, okay? So this is the water. And inside, you have a chamber. In that chamber, you have oxygen gas. And you have this ignition wire. which will help to combust or burn up whatever food sample you place in here. You burn up your sample, and all of that heat that is created goes out into the water. That's my heat. You can measure the temperature of the water. And from there, do some calculations to determine how much heat energy was absorbed by the water. The heat energy absorbed by the water is going to be equal to the energy released from burning the food. And that is the number that's going to be on the nutrition facts for calories. We're not exactly calorimeters. It's a little bit more complicated than that. But it's an estimate, right? So you can kind of have a relative idea of, okay, this has this many calories and that many calories. And there's like calories from fat. You can calculate the number of calories from carbohydrates, from proteins, which we're going to do that soon. So let's look at an energy a nutrition fact label. So in our country, in the U.S., you see the calorie which with the capital C. Like this. In other countries, you see kilojoules, Okay. So one calorie, one capital C calorie, is equal to 1,000 little calories. And one big capital C calorie, you can again write it as one kilocalorie. So these are just two more equalities that you can add to your bag. Notice how there is fat carbohydrates, and protein. We can figure out how many calories are provided by each of those things. So this table here is going to be helpful for figuring out the energy value of a food. So if you know how many carbs, how, how many grams of carbs, fat, and protein are in a food, you can calculate roughly how much energy will be provided if you break that food down. So you don't have to memorize this table. You'll get that information on the exam. Let's try it. You have a cup of whole milk, and that has 13 grams of carbohydrates, 9 grams of fat, and 9 grams of protein. How many kilocalories does a cup of whole milk contain? Round your answer to the tens place. So I put the chart here so that you don't have to flip back and forth. Pause this, give it a shot, and then check your work. So we need to set up an equation that's going to take into account the carbs, fat, and protein. We've got 13 grams of carbohydrates, 
And when we look at our chart, we get four kilocals per gram. Now we need to take into account the fat. So we're going to take those calories and add it to the ones that we get from the fat. There's nine grams of fat. And we get 9 kcal per gram of fat. Finally, we're going to look at the protein. 9 grams of protein. And you get 4 kcal per gram of protein. When you do all of that and add it together, we should get something in the ballpark of 169 kcal. Now you're supposed to round your answer to the tens place. So that's 170 kcal, and that's C. We'll do some more of these in class. Now we're going to get to specific heat. Still talking about energy. We're going to define specific heat, and we're also going to do some calculations to calculate heat loss or heat gained. Specific heat, which we're going to abbreviate SH, Specific heat is different for different substances. And what it measures is the amount of heat that raises the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. Sounds kind of similar to a calorie, right? I know. Only this time, the specific heat, we're not just talking about water. We're talking about any substance, however much heat it takes to raise one gram of the substance by one degree Celsius. The units in SI are joules per gram degree Celsius, and I'll write it out again so you'll see it like that. In the metric system, you're going to see calories per gram degree Celsius. And we have an equation to figure out the specific heat. If we do a reaction and we can figure out how much heat is given off or how much heat is absorbed, like think about the calorimeter, then we can measure heat, right? And we know the mass of our sample, and we can measure the temperature. So if we have those three things, we can calculate the specific heat. This table has some examples of specific heats for different substances. You do not need to memorize it. It is here for your own entertainment. You may need to reference it for homework, something like that, but you don't need to memorize it. Any specific heat that you need to do a calculation, you will be provided. If you need to calculate specific heat, then you'll have all the information to do so for that problem. So let's talk through the learning check question to get make sure that we understand specific heat. So when ocean water cools, the surrounding air is going to cool, warm, or stay the same. Have your guess. Okay. When the ocean water cools, that means, let me get my blue on, okay. So we've got ocean water, and it's cooling, which means heat is being released to the environment. So you're going to heat up the surrounding air. 
Now let's do number two. Sand in the desert is hot during the day and it's cool at night. Sand must have a high specific heat or low specific heat. Think about it. Lock in your answer. If the sand is heating up and cooling down really quickly as the temperature of the day goes up and then goes down, then it must not take a lot of energy for the sand to heat up. That means that you're going to have a low specific heat. So make sure that that one makes sense. If it makes sense to you, then you understand the concept of specific heat. If you don't, then we'll work on it in class. We can do calculations with specific heat, okay? You can calculate the amount of heat lost or gained, and we can measure the mass and the temperature, like I was saying before. If we have all those things, we can write a heat equation. So the generic equation, heat is equal to mass times temperature change times specific heat. If we write that with symbols, mass is abbreviated with an M. Temperature change is the delta T. Remember, this triangle is a delta. And then SH is specific heat. We can have specific heat in two different units. We can have the metric system units with the calories per gram degree Celsius, or SI units, which has joules per gram degree Celsius. Either way, we can use calories or joules to get what we need. What is the specific heat if 24.8 grams of a metal absorbs 275 joules of energy and the temperature rises from 20.2 degrees Celsius to 24.5 degrees Celsius? That's a mouthful. We need to figure out an equation that to use, right? What you need to do is look at the energy that you have. We have joules. So that means we're going to be using this flavor of the equation because we've got joules, so we are going to end up calculating a specific heat in joules per gram degree Celsius. Now we need to rearrange this equation. So I'm going to write it like this. Just know that our units for specific heat are going to have joules per gram degree Celsius. I'm going to abbreviate heat with an H. So if heat is equal to mass times delta T times specific heat, we need to isolate specific heat on one side and everything else on the other. So we're going to divide by M delta T. When you do that, you've got specific heat on one side, and then your heat divided by delta T on the other. From there, you're just plugging in the numbers. So our H, the heat, is 275 joules. The mass is 24.8 grams. And our delta T is 24.5 degrees Celsius minus 20.2 degrees Celsius. So that's the setup for this problem. If you do this, then you'll get a certain number of six eggs, right? So when you subtract, we have to the tenth place, so 24.5 minus 20.2 is going to give you 4.3 degrees Celsius. 
when you do all the math, you end up with 2.578 from your calculator. But we need two sig figs. With sig figs, you're going to get 2.6, and don't forget your units, gram degree Celsius. So that's how to calculate specific heat. You could also be asked, let's say that you're given the amount of heat, the temperature change, and the specific heat. You could calculate the mass of the sample. So you need to be able to rearrange these equations to solve for the unknown. Finally, we're going to talk about changes of state. So whenever you're going from solid to a liquid or something like that, there's energy involved and there's some terminology that we need to put in place so we can talk in an educated fashion about what's going on. So we're going to be able to describe changes of state among solids, liquids, and gases and calculate the amount of energy released or absorbed during these processes. Let's talk about melting and freezing. Melting is going from a solid to a liquid. The melting point is the temperature that melting occurs. So if you think about water, 32 degrees C, or C, 32 degrees F, 0 degrees C. That's when we're looking at the tipping point for melting and freezing. So freezing is going from a liquid to a solid. So if you have a solid and you put in heat, you're eventually going to get up to that 32 degrees if it's water, and you're going to melt until you've got all liquid. If you've got liquid water and you cool it, cool it, cool it until you have gotten to the threshold of 32 degrees Fahrenheit, zero degrees Celsius, then you're going to freeze. So these two processes are reversible. You put heat in, you melt. You take heat out, you freeze. Sublimation and deposition. Now we're talking about going from a solid directly to a gas and vice versa. So sublimation, you add heat to a solid to make a gas. The opposite is deposition, where you have a gas and you remove the heat to make a solid. The best example of something that does this is dry ice. So dry ice is solid carbon dioxide, CO2. If you have dry ice and you put it out on the table or something, or you just have a box where you open it up, you're going to see that, you know, think about all those mad scientist movies with all the beakers and flasks of different colored stuff and you've got all the clouds of smoke, it's just dry ice in water that has food coloring. And what you're observing is sublimation, that dry ice going from a solid to gaseous CO2. Now we're going to talk about evaporation, boiling, and condensation. So water evaporates when molecules on the surface have enough energy to form a gas. So think about, I am no artist, but let's say that you've got a pot on a burner, and 
and you've got some water in it. The water that's on the top of this surface is going to evaporate. So that's the very top of the surface. It gets enough energy from being heated to evaporate and make a gas. When you cool that gas, you're going to take some of the energy out and you're going to form a liquid. That is called condensation. So if you could capture the gas coming off of here, take away some of that heat, you would go back to having liquid water again. Condensation. During evaporation, the molecules of that liquid are converted at the surface, okay? They're converted to gas at the surface of the liquid. We're not talking about all the way down here. We're talking about up here. When water is boiling, all of the water molecules have enough energy to form a gas. So when you're waiting to do that pasta, you'll see a little bit of, you know, gas forming. You'll see a little bit of steam. But that rolling boil, when you're seeing a bunch of bubbles and stuff, that is what we're talking about. So the bubbles of water vapor are appearing throughout the liquid. You've got the bubbles coming from the bottom of the pot and floating up to the top. I wish I could draw that. I can't. So the difference between evaporation and boiling, remember that. Evaporation only at the surface. Boiling is throughout the liquid. I put this in here because we had a lot of terms. We had melting, freezing, boiling, condensing. So all of those different terms, you can use this blank chart to try to fill in how these processes work. Uh, we also had sublimation and deposition. So if you're starting with a solid, like some ice, to go to liquid water, you would need to melt. Right? So that's what we're talking about. When I post this, I will make sure that this is a clean slide so that you can fill it in yourself and make sure you understand the relationship between the words and whether you're increasing the temperature or decreasing the temperature, which is the same as putting heat in or taking heat out. The last part of this, we're going to talk about the energy that is required when you're moving through changes in state. The heat of fusion talks about the amount of heat released when one gram of a liquid freezes at its freezing point or the amount of heat needed to melt one gram of solid at its melting point. So the heat released during freezing is the same as the heat needed during melting. So heat release, remember, heat release. Heat needed, 
going to be absorbed, so you need to put energy into the system. But that amount, that number amount, is going to be the same. For water, the heat of fusion is 80 calories per gram or 334 joules per gram. You know how to convert between those two, okay? Because you have an equality that tells you what one calorie is equal to in joules. So don't forget that. You'll be provided with the heat of fusion and any other constants like that for the exam. The way that you calculate the amount of heat, so let's say that you had a sample of water that was 20 grams, you take that mass and multiply it by the heat of fusion, and that tells you the amount of heat that's necessary. Likewise, there's a heat of vaporization, and that describes when you're going from a liquid to a gas at the boiling point, or if you're going from a gas to a liquid. It's the same idea where you have one number and we're talking about either adding heat to make the gas or removing heat to condense. The heat of vaporization for water is much bigger than the heat of fusion for water. So let's do some practice on using these, um, these, these figures. How many joules are needed to melt 32 grams of ice at zero degrees Celsius? You're going to be provided with the heat of fusion, and you need to know that to get the total heat for your sample, you need to take the mass and multiply by the heat of fusion. You know that you need the heat of fusion because we're talking about melting. So you won't be told use the heat of fusion, but you'll be provided with all of these constants. You fill in all of your numbers. We're left with joules. And remember, there's a number for this in calories, too, but the question is asking for joules. So that's why I pulled the 334 joules per gram, because it makes life easier. Why do it in calories and have to convert when you can simply use the heat of fusion in joules per gram? When you do that multiplication, your calculator will tell you that many joules. But we need to figure out significant figures. There's three sig figs here. So let's report our answer as three sig figs. And it's easiest to do that using scientific notation. If you are having trouble going from the calculator number to the scientific notation, let me know. We've gone over scientific notation, but that doesn't mean you can't ask again. Now let's do one with the heat of vaporization. How many kilojoules are released when 50 grams of steam from a volcano condenses at 100 degrees Celsius? and we have the heat of vaporization is 2,260 joules per gram. So there's a couple of ways that we can do this. We have to give our answer in kilojoules. So we can either convert the heat of vaporization to kilojoules per gram, or we can simply do the math and then convert later. Remember that your total heat is going to be equal to your mass times your heat of vaporization, which I'm going to abbreviate in that way. Our mass is 50 
grams, our heat of vaporization, 2,260 joules for every gram. We're left with joules. Do the math. And you should get this answer in joules. But that's not what we're asking for. We're looking for kilojoules. Kilojoules means 1,000 joules. Because this K is the prefix kilo. So let's take our 113,000 joules and multiply by a conversion factor that will get us from joules to kilojoules. We need to cancel out joules, so they need to go on the bottom. That means the one kilojoule is going to go on the top. And we got that from our equality. Okay. So I did not write out both of the conversion factors here. I figured out which conversion factor I needed by putting the joules where I needed them to be to cancel them out. So that is your final answer. 113 kilojoules. So if this were a multiple choice question and you had this as an option and this as an option, even though this, is, this one is technically correct, the question is asking for kilojoules. So it would be wrong. Make sure that you answer the question in the units that are requested. So with sublimation and deposition, we're not going to talk about any math for that, but know that sublimation is used to prepare freeze-dried food. So you can store those for a long time. You get all of that water out of there so that the food can last on the shelf for a long time. Now we're kind of getting to the last leg of this chapter, talking about heating and cooling curves. So for each substance, you can make a heating or cooling curve. Let's say that we're doing this for water, or we should say H2O, because water specifies liquid. At really cold temperatures, so this um, on the y-axis, is temperature in degrees Celsius. So if we're at negative 40 degrees Celsius, we're absolutely a solid. So we've got ice here. As you add heat, which that's what this x-axis is, that's heat, you're eventually going to hit zero degrees Celsius. That's the melting point for for ice, okay? So you're going to melt, and notice how there's a plateau here. So a plateau is just flat. And that happens, let's see, occurs at change of state. So whenever you're transitioning between one state of matter to another, you're going to hit a plateau. You're going to be putting heat in, let's say, for melting, but you're not going to be raising the temperature. Then once all of the ice is liquid, you can keep adding heat, and you're going to heat up the liquid. So that part is the slope. the temperature of the substance 
is increasing. Now again, we're looking at a heating curve. So that's why we're talking about increasing temperature. But we could do this in the opposite orientation and it would be a cooling curve and you would say that the temperature is decreasing over time. And I'll show you an example of that too. Once you hit the boiling point for water, you're gonna hit another plateau because all of the liquid water has to be converted to gas. Once that happens, then that gas is gonna to continue to increase in temperature. So that's a heating curve for water. You should be able to look at this and interpret it. And if I asked you, at, you know, at 60 degrees, what state is H2O in, you would tell me it's a liquid. So you need to be able to do that kind of thing. Here's a cooling curve. So it's the opposite. It's still temperature on the y-axis, but instead we're talking about the loss of heat. And that's on our x-axis. If you start with steam, which is 140 de at 140 degrees C, you cool it down until you reach 100 degrees. That is the boiling point for water. So once you hit that threshold, if you're coming down in temperature, you're removing heat, then you're going to start condensing. Once all of that steam is converted to water, then you can continue to cool and you see that your temperature is decreasing. So that's another slope, right? That's where the temperature change is happening. Once you hit the freezing point, then you no longer have a change in your temperature. It's a plateau. Then once you have the ice, you can continue to remove heat. So it's the same thing. It's just whether or not you're adding heat or removing heat. Oh, one more thing I want to mention before the problem. So during these times where you have a temperature change, delta T, the energy associated with that is a specific heat. It's calculated with a specific heat. Because remember, specific heat, we're talking about the amount of heat is equal to the mass times the change in temperature times the specific heat of the substance. So if we wanted to calculate the amount of heat that's being lost when you're going from steam, that's 100 degrees, to ice, that is zero degrees, or at least getting water down to the zero degrees, you would use the mass of the water and the temperature change of 100 degrees Celsius and the specific heat of water. So with that said, we can try this problem. Calculate the total heat in joules needed to convert 15 grams of liquid ethanol at 25 degrees C to gas at its boiling point of 78 degrees C. We have a specific heat and we have a heat of vaporization. So let's talk about what's going on. We have liquid ethanol at 25 degrees. We're heating it up 
to 78 degrees C. And we're making a gas. So we have a slope and we have a plateau. Those are the two things that we need to calculate. So when we're doing this, this is what our equation is going to look like. We've got the mass times the delta T times the specific heat of ethanol. And that's going to give us the heat for the temperature change from 25 to 78 degrees Celsius. We also have to add the heat from the conversion of the liquid ethanol to the gas. And for that, you're going to take the mass times the heat of vaporization for ethanol. And that's going to be for the state change. from liquid to gas. So there's two parts here. We're heating up the liquid ethanol, and then we're converting it all to gas. When we fill in numbers here, we're going to fill them all in from the problem. So you've got, let me change it to a different color, 15 grams for your mass, and if you do the subtraction for the delta T, you should get 53.0 degrees Celsius. The specific heat was given to us, and that's 2.46 joules per gram degree Celsius. You're going to do all of that and get a number. And you're going to add that to the mass, the sum, or the product, excuse me, of the mass times the heat of vaporization. So you'll get a sum from one, a sum from the other. I keep saying sum, it's a product. Sorry, y'all. You multiply this part first, and you get a product. You multiply this part, you get a product. And you add those two together. When you add them together, you should get 14,560 joules. If you do the whole string in your calculator, you're going to get something slightly different. But it's still going to be in the same ballpark. And if you're doing a multiple choice exam, like you will be, you'll be close enough to get the right answer. So the way that rounding is done in this book is a little bit different from other chemistry textbooks. We're going to do more of these problems together. So here's one more. When a volcano erupts, 175 grams of steam at 100 degrees Celsius is released. How many kilojoules are lost when steam condenses and then freezes at zero degrees C? So here we're talking about a cooling curve. So we're starting up here with steam at 100 degrees C. That's not what we're doing. We're cooling it until it's all a liquid. So it's going to condense. 
Then we're dropping the temperature some more until it gets to zero degrees C where it's going to freeze. We have to calculate how much energy is going to happen or how much energy is going to be released. So there's three steps here. We need the heat of vaporization. Then we need just the heat that's associated with specific heat for changing the temperature. Then we need the heat of fusion. So that's three parts. Let's set it up. My hand just has a totally different... It's like my hand is connected to somebody else's brain right now. So we're going to do the heat of vaporization times the mass plus the heat associated with the change in temperature And then we're going to need that heat of fusion times the mass. When you fill in all of those numbers, and remember, these, these are numbers, so this is for water. So the heat of vaporization, we already know. the mass we get from the problem, and we're just filling everything in. The temperature change, we're going from 100 degrees Celsius to zero, so that you don't need your calculator for. And the specific heat of water was also provided earlier on. And then finally, the heat of fusion. It takes longer to write it out sometimes than it does put it in your calculator. So please, please, please make sure you write it out so that you have something to reference when you're putting it into your calculator. So you're going to figure out the product for here, the product here, and the product here. Then you're going to add them all together, and you're going to have an answer with three sig figs. Well, you need to round to three sig figs. Not kilojoules, those are joules. Now we need to take that answer and convert it to kilojoules, just like we did in a previous problem. So you should get B. And we're going to go through another couple of these examples in class because the hardest part is identifying which steps you're going to need to do calculations for and what kind of calculation it is. Of course, i got to throw in my reminders here. So, lots of reminders. One, the homework for section 2.6 and 2.7, chapter 3, and the Chapter 3 quiz are due on September 13th by 11.59 p.m. So that's Mastering Chemistry. So you need to complete Chapter 2 and Chapter 3. Oh, there's also the Chapter 2 quiz. 
So you have the Chapter 2 lecture. We haven't gone over everything together as a class for Chapter 2, but you have everything that you need to start attempting the homework. But I decided to split up the Chapter 2 homework since I knew we wouldn't be able to go through all of it in class. But you can work on it still because you've got a lot due on September 13th. So please, please, please do it. There's also going to be the Chapter 3 check-in that's going to be due on Sunday the 13th as well. It's going to be, it's short, I promise. So don't say, eh, do it. It's going to literally be just a few questions and it won't be that bad. You need to complete that practice exam to test the compatibility of your computer with the Respondus Lockdown Browser before we have exam one. It's going to give me a little bit of information about you, and you're going to make sure that you can actually take the test. If you don't take the initiative to take the practice and make sure that your computer is compatible and you know how to use the Lockdown Browser, then if you don't take exam one, that's not on me, that's on you. And exams are worth a fair chunk of your grade. So make sure when you download the Lockdown Browser, you open up the Lockdown Browser and navigate to Blackboard through the Lockdown Browser so that you can open up the exam. Don't open Chrome, don't open Firefox or anything like that. Open the Lockdown Browser and then go to Blackboard. And I mentioned exam one, it's going to cover chapters one through three. It will be available at 8 a.m. on Wednesday, September 16th. It will close on Friday, September 18th at 11.59 p.m. You'll need an hour or so to take the exam. So anytime over those few days, you can take the exam. I'll give you more details about that as we get a little bit closer. Other than that, that's Chapter 3. I have office hours. We're establishing office hours, and we'll keep doing that. I'll remind you of when um, and how to access them. So use me as a resource. Study together. Exchange phone numbers. Um, help each other out. Until I see you in class. Bye.